At some point, we all have to move on. Whether it's your favourite third-party library that's just not in support anymore, whether it's that NuGet package that you were using to get around image processing, which is now deprecated. Maybe it's that Python library that has gone from freemium to paid. And after months of usage and learning, we have to go back to the drawing board and start afresh. It's frustrating, and we've all been there. And you pick up whatever the new package is, and you're just not enthusiastic about it. It's not the same as when you first picked up that charting library and it was all new features. We're just replacing stuff that already exists. It's not as fun. And so maybe you don't put in as much effort. You struggle to bring yourself to do it. The task takes way longer than expected. You're just not invested. Well, this is actually a psychological pattern that if you fall into it, you're putting your career in danger. The industry is constantly changing and moving. In these cases, I've just said about replacing a, just a small library, but some people get the phone call from their boss and it's like, right, we're moving from desktop to web. We're going to completely change tech stack and you need to know it so that we can start developing as soon as possible. And if you don't pick it up, then you're just going to get replaced by somebody who does know. So in this video, I'm going to break up that challenge and show you the graph that actually makes it a lot less scary and a bit easier to deal with. And then I'm going to identify for you the habit that will ruin your career and how to get around it. So I don't want to state the obvious, but software engineering is hard. So in a project that I'm working on, we've decided to migrate from NUnit to XUnit, which is a unit testing library for .NET. And when you're starting from square one, sort of just, just pitching out the learning path that you need to follow, it's quite overwhelming, right? Fundamentally, they do the same thing and they share similar patterns, but you need to understand the basics of what makes the library different. The best practices are going to change. You've got these things called facts and theories, which can be populated completely differently to the way that typically you just bring in test data from its own class. And when you start this, you don't have this nicely laid out diagram of how to go from A to B. You're just left with the fact that, shit, I need to go from where I am now, which is knowing nothing, to writing production level code. You know, and that was frustrating. I I just learned how to do NUnit. I didn't particularly like writing unit tests anyway, and now I had to learn an entirely new library just to get going with it. So I was on this task where it was implement and then unit test it. And so I probably spent a day and a half implementing the problem and thought, okay, I've probably got half a day left to write the unit test. But then I remembered, oh, no, we've completely changed the unit test library. So... I got to work. I got to stand up on day three and I said to the team, you know, I was finished with the implementation one and a half days in and now we're double that and I feel like I've just got my head around the basics of writing in unit. We didn't have any examples in the project that anybody else had written that were similar to what I was doing, so I was just completely going blind. So what did that look like? Well, first of all, I had a handover from the person who decided that we'd be moving to the framework, which was pretty good. Gave me a rough idea, but obviously you get a bunch of information at once, and that doesn't mean that it's then in your brain. So the next thing I did, I went through their documentation, which every library worth looking into normally has a pretty good getting started. Just to get your head around what's actually going on. And once I'd worked my way through this, basically what I'd do is I'd, I'd pair program generically with ChatGPT. So I'd, I'd generically say, look, I've got a class that roughly does this. How would you go about testing this with XC? And then as you go through, you explain the problems that you encounter. And the next thing you know, you've got a test. And it's not great. So once that was done, I was confident I could start writing the tests, which was cool. Wrote the tests up. Had a rough idea of what I was doing, but not a perfect one. But the problem then you run into is this isn't going to be remotely near best practice but fortunately i'm not an isolated bubble i could have gone and read a lot of documentation on best practices but when you're working on a team that's a resource that's worth using because first of all just because they're be best practices globally for one company doesn't mean that the best practices are wherever you work so i put up a draft pr which okay it had a fair few mistakes in it i'd never written one of these before so people had a look through helped me out with it so my last day was literally just spent finalizing it now this is the challenge right is that what normally would have only taken me half a day to do actually ended up taking me five and a half days. And you can imagine each day <laughs> in stand up at the beginning, I felt that. It was like, oh God, like this should have only taken me half a day. I, I haven't even started writing the test by day three. And then when I get to the finish line on day six, I'm thinking, Christ, I should have had this done by the end of day two. What have I done? Because I'm looking at my small amount of code that really should have only taken me half a day to write. And when you're in that moment, I think you forget actually all of the steps that go into being a software engineer. You're not just writing code, you're keeping up to date, and that's part of it. Part of my work was getting to grip with this new framework and then getting something production level out. You should never look at a pull request that you've done and think, ah, oh, how did that take me four or five days? As long as you've justified it, because I can guarantee you that day two, day three, day four, I'm saying like, look, I'm looking to basics, I haven't seen this before. Right, I've written some tests, but I don't feel so confident. Uh, I'm going to throw it up for draft PR. Okay, the draft PR had a few back and forths. Uh, I think I've got a hang of it. And by day six, 
it's implemented. Happy days. Nobody cares. But I think when you get to the end and you look back at how long it took to do something, you forget all of the intermediate stuff. It's okay to take your time. You're not going to learn things overnight. This is part of the job. It's developing yourself so that you can continue to do the job. So if you look at learning theory, the curve looks something like this. It's an inverse exponential. It's really hard at the beginning, but you're learning the most. And then after that, it's easier, but you're not learning as much. It's really hard to master. You can get 80% of what you need to know very quickly. Sure, it's going to be hard because you've got to learn a lot in that space. If you want to truly master something, then you're going off into the tail end. All you need to be capable enough to do it for work is probably like in this zone here. And you've got to remember that if you're learning something completely new, this is the part of the graph that you're dealing with. It's the steepest. You've got to take in the most. Because in order to understand one concept, you have to understand the two concepts beneath it. You've got no foundation. It sucks. But that's okay. It's meant to suck. It sucks for everybody. Sure, you might find some people that have an aptitude for certain things. That's probably because they've had adjacent things or relevant things. This is where the whole game of transferable skills comes in. Where, ah, oh, I recognize the patterns. You know, I probably picked up this unit testing framework faster than somebody who's never written a unit test. And it's that accumulation of experience for all that'll squish this graph so that you learn quicker but I mean squishing it isn't going to make that big of a difference and so the last thing I want to cover here is the thing I touched on at the beginning of this video which is my overall attitude not only did I feel bad about this pretty much the whole way through because it felt like I was taking this excessive amount of time to do something but also from the get-go I had this negative opinion of oh I already know how to do this why do I need to learn again and what I want you to think about is is people that you've met before the chances are You've met the two archetypes of, of growth mindset, right? You've probably met somebody who every single time that they get given something new, oh, it's effort, I can't be bothered. Every hardship, every difficult thing, it's, oh, I have to go and do that. And then there's probably the polar opposite person that you've met who seems excited to do everything, no matter how shit it, every single thing that they come against, it's, oh, wow, what a great opportunity. I can't wait to go get good at this. The only difference between those two people is their perspective. You know, there's the analogy of the car, where have you ever had a situation where somebody's mentioned a very specific kind of car, and then you've gone out and suddenly you're seeing that car absolutely everywhere? It's because you're looking for it. If you're looking for things to be problems, everything becomes a problem. If you look for opportunity, everything's an opportunity. And that was the mistake that I made. And you can imagine that this would compound over your career. If you get a year into software engineering and feel like you've learned everything, and everything beyond that is then a burden, you're going to spend the next 10 years of your career hating every time that you have to learn something new. But if you keep that mindset of, wow, this is an opportunity to learn, this is an opportunity to grow, I'm going to be more competent, more employable, I'm going to be able to, it's going to work towards pay rises and whatever motivates you. That's the thing that's going to set you apart. And that's the thing that's going to get, that's the thing that's going to boost your career rather than sink it. Now, I kind of touched on here how I solved the problem, but I actually have a video where I go in depth how I solve problems as a software engineer. So if you click this video here, nope, over here, it should take you to that video and I hope it helps. Cheers.